Good morning, brothers and sisters. We have a few announcements this Sunday morning. Jean Slimpen, Dave Slimpen's mom, had a home going last Sunday at 11.42 a.m. Sunday, May 17th. She went to her eternal home. And there are more details and a link to her obituary in the churchwide email that was sent out this past Friday. Uh, another announcement is, is that if you have a key to the old building, um, please let Mark Bittison know so he can make sure that you have a code to the alarm system over there. Um, it's been recently installed, so if you have a key and you're going to get into the old building, you will need a code now. So please contact Mark if you have a key to the old building. Johnny Debenschmidt moved a couple weeks ago, and she sent a little thank you in the churchwide email. Um, you can check the churchwide email for her new address as well. So just a few announcements. Um, let's go to our time of prayer together this morning. We would encourage you to pray for our missionaries, Craig and Brenda Landrum. Again, they are at home in Texas, up in Burnett, Texas, uh, with Brenda's parents. Um, I would, I've been praying for them that God would be able to continue to use them in evangelism and discipleship. It sounds like he has been, but uh, that God would use them more and more in evangelism and discipleship remotely, uh, and that he would um, use them powerfully and uh, to a greater degree. Uh, we would ask you to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, for our government authorities as they continue to make um, laws and continue to try to govern. Um, let's pray for wisdom for them, that they would be men and women of justice, and that God would draw them to himself. Uh, we'd like to pray that this, this pandemic would end uh, for our military personnel and our first responders, and for our own hearts this morning, that God would prepare us and soften our hearts to hear his word and to be changed, to become more like Christ. So you can pause the video now if you want. Um, take some time. We would encourage you to take some time to pray as a family. And we've had some really sweet prayer times together in our living room as a family watching the video and I would encourage you to do the same. So let's take a few minutes to pray. Father God, we ask that you would change our hearts. Father, thank you for promising to be with us always, even into the end of the world. Lord, for promising never to leave us or forsake us, but to be with us. Father, may we walk with you. Um, Lord, it would be a shame for you to be near to us and with us and for us to ignore you like you're not there. And Father, I'm afraid that too often that's how we live our lives, forgetting that you're right there with us, forgetting and choosing to disregard your presence in our lives. And Lord, doing what we want and pursuing what we want and acting the way we want and letting our attitudes Lord, be in the flesh and follow sin. So, Lord, may we be ever mindful of your presence, that you are with us. And may it change us, Lord. May it change us and make us more like Jesus Christ. Father, I ask for Craig and Brenda that they would walk with you closely, that you would use them in a powerful way. Lord, we ask that you would stop the spread of the virus, that it would just die away and be done and no longer an issue. Lord, during this time, may we make the most of the time that we have. May we draw close to you. May we seek you first. Lord, for our first responders and our military personnel, that you'd protect them and keep them safe. May they honor you in their lives, draw them close to yourself. Father, for our government authorities, that you would protect them. Lord, that you would draw them to yourself. Lord, that you would give them wisdom, that they would do justice and love mercy. Come to know Christ as their Savior and then walk humbly with their God. May we be the best of citizens, Lord, and always mindful that we are ultimately citizens of heaven first. We ask for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, Lord, that don't have religious freedom, who are persecuted, ostracized, beaten and killed for their faith. Lord, we ask that you would be with them in a special way. Enable them, strengthen them, may your power flow in them and through them to withstand the temptations of the evil one, to hold fast to the teachings of Jesus Christ and their allegiance to him. Lord, use them mightily for your glory and for your namesake. Father, be with our hearts this morning. Change us and make us more like Jesus. And I ask this in his name. Amen.
Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Can you come before the throne of God covered with the blood of Jesus Christ? Have you been redeemed? Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written. No tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look. And see him there who made an end of all my sin because the sinless Savior died. My sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood. on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. day that 
will be. There'll be no more sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there, and forever. will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day When he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, and so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. And when the 
the sky We're starless in the void of the night Our God is an awesome God He spoke into the darkness and created the light Our God is an awesome God The judgment and wrath He poured out on Sodom The mercy and grace He gave us at the cross I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten Our God is an awesome God Our God is an awesome God He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love Our God is an awesome God Our God is an awesome God He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love Our God is an awesome God Our God is an awesome God Scripture reading for this morning is in the book of Joel, chapter 2. So if you would please turn there with me in your copy of the scriptures or find it on your phone or device. Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. This is the word of the Lord. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Or your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of Yahweh will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as Yahweh has said, even among the survivors whom Yahweh calls. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, it's certainly a joy once again to be with you this morning. And I want to thank you for coming, those of you that are in the live service, and those of you that are home, if you are not under some special reason to stay at home, uh, shame on you, you should be here. Uh, we'd like to see this church once again, as many as can. Now, if you're not supposed to be here, that's okay, we don't want you here. But we sure do want people that are able to come to be able to come and worship with us and uh, to enjoy each other. I want you to know if you are not coming and you are capable to come, uh, people are missing you. They're missing your fellowship. It's not just what you're missing, they're missing you. So do the rest of your brothers and sisters a real favor if you are able to come and you're not one of those that, uh, like me, that needs to stay home a little longer. Uh, I know that watching your pastor, I'm talking to those of you that are here live, watching your pastor on a screen is not the best, but I do want you to know that this is not a canned sermon. This is preached with you in mind, and it is only preached about a day and a half before you're seeing it. So um, if you think it's maybe odd watching the pastor on a screen, I talked to several people that were here last Sunday, and they said that it gave no problem to them. So we just uh, hope all of you, when you're capable, when you're able, 
uh, as far as the virus goes, that you come and, and join with us. Uh, eventually, we'll have live, uh, and uh, we don't want you to wait that long, though. Just come and enjoy your brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, as I've said many times the last few weeks, that we are studying the book of Acts, and we are in chapter 2. And uh, this chapter 2 tells us the result when the apostles preached on the day of Pentecost. What were the result of the people there, especially the Jews that lived there? What was the result in their lives? And we begin looking at that, those results in verses 6 through 13. Now, I know you've heard these several times in the past few weeks, but I will again read that portion so we know exactly what we're looking at. And this is the word of God. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya and around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they're full of sweet wine. We looked at this numbers of reactions of the people and we, when God was working and we already talked the last few weeks about they were bewildered and they were amazed. And I won't go back into that, but let's look where it went from amazement because that's what makes a difference. After those that were amazed, we see now two qualities that kind of are opposites from each other. On one side, there's a positive reaction, and the other side, a negative reaction. Those that were amazed and accepted that is from God were astonished. And those that were amazed and tended to reject that from God, they were perplexed. And we'll get into that later, why that would be so, or why we would understand it to be so. Let's look at astonishment. Actually, astonishment is really a pretty, pretty good word. So their third reaction, astonishment, I think King James says marvel there, which is pretty good, uh, <clears throat> because astonishment may not carry the meaning as much as marvel does. Actually, astonishment is very similar to amazement, and uh, it has to do with wonder, uh, majesty, this wonder, what is going on here? And not like I'm just wondering about it, but the wonder of it all. As a matter of fact, look at those two words right there. We sing songs about it. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. And my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. So the definition or the meaning of the word astonishment Marvel and wonder is, are words we use to describe the majesty of our God, of our Savior. We can go on from there. Astonishment means a sense of awe of the work of God and of the God of the work. The word awe, awe is a pretty special word to me. I look at awe as being a superlative I decided some years ago I needed some superlative to describe God and His majesty, and I chose the word awesome. And I don't call anything else awesome but God. Now, I'm not saying you're wrong if you call something else awesome. Oh, that ice cream was awesome. But to me, I use that for God because I need some superlative that I don't use for anything else that describes my God. So in a sense of astonishment is a sense of admiration. And I believe this astonishment leads us, and the purpose of it is it drives us to worship God. It's a positive reaction. 
It's marveling, it's wonderful, it's sense of awe, a sense of admiration. Astonishment, I believe, is a precursor of true worship. Uh, I don't mean astonishment like maybe we would use it. That's why I like the word marvel better in some ways. But our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Well, on the negative side of that, we said was the word perplexity. Some of those, uh, oh, by the way, yeah, astonishment leads us to worship. I should have said that. Perplexity then is the negative side of this. Perplexity is a word that's only used by Luke. Now, if you know anything about Luke, he was a physician, and they say he was a first-class historian. Historians have looked into his work and said he was excellent. He was educated. He probably used words in Greek that the other writers didn't use. And uh, we know people like that. Uh, we may know what they mean, but they're just not part of our regular vocabulary. But the word perplexity was a word that Luke knew, used, and uh, understood. We find, first of all, that uh, in Luke 9, 7, he uses that word. And uh, this is actually talking about Herod. When Herod started, after he had killed John the Baptist, and then people started telling him about the works of Jesus, and they said, maybe John the Baptist has risen from the dead. Anyway, this is where, per, excuse me, where uh, Herod is used for perplexity. In Luke 24, 4, uh, this is at the Easter time. We find that these uh, ladies the, that went to the tomb on Easter morning, and they went there, and the door, the stone was rolled away, and the tomb was empty, and they figured somebody had stolen the, t the body, and they were perplexed. Acts 2.12 is where we're reading right now. Acts 5.24, uh, we find this is the situation with Peter as he was... Uh, excuse me, I think it was all the apostles here, and they were put in jail. And the angel in the middle of the night or sometime let them out of the jail and told them to go preach in the temple. And so the priests in the morning and the uh, chief captain of the guards, they were trying to figure out what to do with these prisoners. And somebody came to them and said, those prisoners have escaped. And as a matter of fact, they're, they're at the temple preaching again. And he said, these priests and so forth were perplexed. In Acts 10, 17, then, is Peter. You remember Peter being a good Jew? Uh, wouldn't eat of anything that was unclean. He wouldn't even go into the house of a Gentile because Gentiles were unclean. He was a good Jew. God wanted him to go to the house of Cornelius to tell him about Jesus. And uh, so Cornelius was there by the seaside at Simon the Tanner's house. And uh, he was up on the rooftop, and he sort of fell into a trance. And there was a vision that, uh, of sheet coming down from heaven with all kinds of unclean animals, according to the Jewish laws. And God told him, Peter, rise and eat. And he says, no way. I'm not going to eat any unclean thing. I've never had any unclean thing. And God says, what I've cleaned or cleansed, don't call unclean. Now there's some men waiting, and they're going to uh, take you to a man. Do, go with them. So at this point, Peter was perplexed, thinking to start with, I'm supposed to do something that I've always been told not to do. So the word perplexed, confused, with uncertainty, troubled, to doubt, an implied negative reaction. So this is why we put it over on the negative side. If some reason or the other, when somebody is perplexed, they're heading kind of in a negative direction. Now, these people that were perplexed, something had already amazed them perhaps, but they had a negative reaction to the things of God that were amazing. When God does His amazing work around us, we're confused and we're amazed. Then what follows is important. Bewilderment, and then amazement, then astonishment. 
In the positive direction, astonishment. In the negative direction, perplexity. So what do you do once you're amazed with the things of God? You either marvel, worship God as a result of it, or you get perplexed and start in a negative direction. We find it as humans difficult to remain neutral very long. We've talked about that. And sometimes we should remain neutral until we understand the truth better. But eventually we will go in a direction to accept or a direction to deny. So what's our choice? When it comes to certain things, maybe we are supposed to put them on the shelf till later because we don't fully understand them. And I talked about this a few weeks ago. Sometimes we need to. We don't understand. But there are some things that we never need to put on the shelf. There's one thing in particular, though. And I may be talking to somebody here. Maybe I'm talking to somebody in their home. But I tell you, there are some things that would be disastrous if we put them on the shelf. And I'm talking about the main thing is your salvation. Are you born again? Are you saved? Do you know Christ as a personal Savior? Let me tell you something. You are a sinner before the holy God of the universe. People maybe want to mock God, laugh at God, do whatever, but I tell you what, we're all accountable to God. And we are sinners. And God is perfect. And God is holy. And God sent His Son Jesus who died for your sins. Wouldn't it be a shame to mock the one who came to die for you? Jesus dying for our sins, paving the way for your acceptance, my acceptance by God. Paving the way for my salvation, your salvation. And don't put your salvation on the shelf. God offers you a gift of eternal life. It's a gift. And God offers it to you. And when you have been offered this gift, there's only three things you can do. You can receive it. You can reject it. And let's say you can put it on the shelf. But I don't think you can. I think putting it on the shelf is a matter of rejecting it. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, don't reject Him. Come to Him now. There was a man in the Bible named Agrippa. When Paul was arrested, and he was brought before Agrippa, uh, other magistrates also, but Agrippa knew a lot about the Jewish prophecies. And so Paul was very comfortable in talking to Agrippa. And he explained about Jesus and the prophecies that he fulfilled when he came. And Agrippa listened carefully. And his response was, Almost you persuade me to become a Christian. Almost. As far as I know, Agrippa's in hell today. Just an almost away from being in heaven, but he's probably not there. At least we have no evidence that Agrippa came to know the Lord. We said perplexity was the negative reaction, and it then, I think, can lead to the negative the most negative thing that was there in this list, and that's mockery. These people mocked what the apostle said. They mocked God. I think there's several common reasons that people mock. We're going to be talking mostly about mockers of the Bible, mockers of God. But we see mockers in other uh, certain uh, categories also. I've seen some pretty bad mockers in uh, the government or politics. Uh, it's kind of disgusting to see mocking during that time. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the reasons I believe that people mock, and this is done, let's say the scriptural, those that are mocking God, often by someone who was very close to God's truth but rejected it. 
Maybe they grew up in a Christian home. Maybe they grew up under the teaching of the Word of God. And somewhere along the line, Satan convinced them the world was more attractive than Christ and evidently able to just live with themselves at the same time having all these things still in their brain that they had learned. One of the things they can do is mock it. And I believe a lot of mocking is done by those who were close, who understood it, but rejected it. Another category is when a person has no real data to reject another's ideas. You know what happens then? They resort to name calling and mocking. I was mentioning about the politics. I can't even remember the guy's name that's on Late Night Tonight Show or whatever it is. I heard him one time, I don't know if he was on that show because I don't watch it, but maybe it was a newscast, but he was mocking President Trump and he was just so rude and childish in his mocking and really because he didn't have anything else to say. And I think this is true. When, when there's an argument of some kind and people get, into the, get to the end of uh, reasons why they believe what they believe and they can't contradict the truth, then they'll tend to start mocking because they've got no real data now. I can't come with something else that makes sense, so I'm going to call you and call you names or mock you or something. A third reason, I believe, and this is very uh, used, I think, it's used for a cover-up for conviction and or shame. They're convicted by God of their need for a Savior or shame because of what they've done to Jesus, and so they covered up by mocking. As far as those that are mocking, especially against the Bible and against God, have placed themselves as antagonists against God. How would you like to be an antagonist against the mighty God of the universe? And you know what? Most of those people would probably say, yeah, they believe in God. Isn't that sad? I don't know how you can say you believe in God and then you want to reject everything that God says. But they have placed themselves as antagonists against God. I don't want to ever go there. I don't want you to. So let's just kind of do a review here. What's happened so far in this second chapter here? The followers of Jesus at that time, about 120, had obeyed him and they stayed in Jerusalem until they received the promise that Jesus had told them about. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. So the day of the celebration of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came on these 120 disciples and two things happened. One was visible and one was invisible. They were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And body of Christ means the universal church. It's sometimes called every Christian is part of that body. Every born again Christian is a part of the body of Christ. And they, when uh, on the day of Pentecost, those 120 were baptized by the Holy Spirit, not by water, but baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And they were made one with him. And then secondly, and by the way, that was the invisible one. They were filled with the Spirit and began to preach the gospel in many different languages. That was the visible one. And, of course, that caused some problems. How did they do that? So when they preached the gospel in many different languages, we see that there were several reactions of the Jewish people. Those from Jerusalem, I don't think the reaction was the same from those other places. There was bewilderment, amazement, astonishment, perplexity, and mocking. But it appears at that time, no one had really preached to the Jews there in Jerusalem in the language they understood. The apostles had been preaching to them in uh, the language of their birth, all those visitors on the day of Pentecost. But I don't see any sign that they had actually been preaching in, in either Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic or whatever they needed at the time. They'd just been preaching to these other people. And so I think now Peter's going to take care of that because now Peter is going to preach a sermon just to them. Verses 14 to 36, and I won't take it all here at one bunch, is Peter's sermon to these Jewish people right there in Jerusalem. Peter took the leadership of explaining to the local Jews 
the mockers that were there, others that were there that weren't mockers, that those preaching were not drunk, because that's what they were accused of. He then went back to the Old Testament that prophesied about this very event in Joel 2, 28 to 32. And you just heard that as, as James read it this morning. So here on the day of Pentecost, Peter began to speak to them using the words of Joel back in the Old Testament, which technically all those people there believed part of their Bible. This is from verses 16 to 18 from Acts 2. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Now you'll see the similarity almost word for word, although it had to be translated in another language. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Sorry about that. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So when Peter mentioned the last days that Joel also mentioned, evidently Peter was talking about the time present to him all the way to the end of the age. Peter was in the last days. This prophecy was starting to be fulfilled in the last days. So all the signs he mentions did not happen on the day of Pentecost. And to be real honest, some have not happened yet, but they will. They all happened before the end of the age. Let me just give you kind of a diagram of, of what, it meant, what is meant by the end of the age, or the, the last days, I mean. When Peter talked about the last days, we said it was talking about from his time on. I've got a picture here that may demonstrate what I'm saying. Starting from the death of Christ, Peter's sermon was not too long afterwards. And everything from then on was the last days. Now, at the end of the last days, or something that I would call the last of the last days, but this is time that just before the tribulation period and the end of the age, there's a line right there that we might live on 2020. It's probably pretty close to the edge of that cliff. I'm no prophet. I can't tell you when it is. But I think we're really in the last of the last of the last days. So we need to stay faithful. Let's go on with Peter's sermon. And I will grant wonders in the sky above any signs of the earth, below blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. Now, this is why so many people get excited about the blood moons. I believe there will be another one this coming week, but you won't see it here. I think you have to be in Australia or somewhere. But this is not the blood moon that he's talking about. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, that's a promise that was made to all people of all times. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. It continues to be true. I want you to stop and think about some of those who were Peter's listeners. Some of those on the day of Pentecost that was hearing him preach. They were there maybe 50 days or so earlier. They'd cried, crucify him, crucify him. And now they were here with their hands basically still dripping with the blood of Jesus. And he was telling them, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You who put him to death, everyone. What a joy it must have been for them to hear these words. Everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Now at this time, I believe Peter turns to his 
present listeners now, not looking back and talking about Joel or anything else, but his present listeners. I want you to stop and think. Suppose you were one of those Jews listening to him at that time. Also imagine that some 50 days earlier you were in a crowd in front of Pilate and you joined with those others calling crucify him, crucify him. Now listen to what he says in his sermon. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Oh, listen to this one. This man, speaking of Jesus, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan of God, you, nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Excuse me, I'm trying to get my time back on here. That's a pretty pointed sermon. You, don't ever accuse me of being too pointed in my messages. I never put my finger out and said, you. Some of you think I have, but I haven't. A quote from my hero, Adrian Rogers. The delicate, brittle saints being produced in our religious hothouses today are hardly to be compared with the committed, expendable believers who once gave their witness among men and the fault lies with our leaders. They are too timid to tell the people all the truth. And Peter says, you turned him over to be killed. Peter's message, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Though Then in verses 25 to 28, Peter begins to quote David from Psalm 16, 8 to 11, speaking of the coming Messiah. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Brethren, this is Peter speaking again, not quoting David. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And there were numbers of witnesses there that had seen Jesus after he was risen from the dead. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. God is in all this. Listen to what's being said. For it was not David, Peter's voice speaking again, it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, quote, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He's the Savior, he's the Christ. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. He's what you've been looking for. He's been what you're waiting for. And you crucified him. Peter now, at this sermon, was filled with the Spirit. And he began this powerful sermon. And as a result of that, 3,000 people were saved that one day. 3,000 of these Jews some from all over the world that were going to take the gospel back to where they lived were saved on one day. So we might examine for a minute what effect did the fullness of the Spirit have on Peter in his sermon? 
want you to look back for a little bit and stop and think about Peter in days gone by. Now, he had a supernatural boldness. He had a supernatural understanding of God's Word. He had a supernatural power in his preaching. But it wasn't always that way. Let's look at this first one. Would you say Peter had a supernatural boldness before the day of Pentecost, as we read in Matthew 26, 69? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. And he swore and said, No, I don't know the man. He was really bold, wasn't he? A servant girl had him running scared. But at Pentecost, no fear of man. Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Acts 5, 29, Peter, later on in the book of Acts here, the priest, the high priest told him, you can't speak in his name, we forbid it. And so Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. That caused some real problems for the priesthood. I just ask a question, on which side of Pentecost do you live? Are you squirming and timid because maybe somebody thinks you're odd? You know, if you're a Christian and some people don't think you're a little bit odd, there may be something wrong with you. Because we are just not like the world. I don't mean we need to try to be odd. I just mean that there are certain things that make you different. So they should see something different. We're accountable to God no matter what pressure man puts on us. The fear of God, not the fear of man. Now Peter obviously didn't fear the crowd then. He was bold. We're going to obey God, not men. But you know, even Peter, there was a select group of people that he was afraid of. I've seen this in Christianity. There's this group that kind of has some little something in common with each other. Uh, some, either some doctrine or some practice or some lifestyle or whatever. And they wouldn't dare say something or do something that that group would criticize. I've heard of people that would hide their television set, set in a closet because they didn't want anybody to know they had one. Some people might say that was bad. They feared people. They feared some of the select group. Now that's not any better than fearing man. Fearing lost people. Peter had the problem though. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 12. But when Cephas, and that's, what, that's Peter's name, came to Antioch, Paul speaking, says, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Because prior to the coming of certain men from James, back from Jerusalem, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The mighty Peter, and here Paul was a younger apostle and everything else, and he stood up to Peter says, you're wrong. You ate with the Gentiles before these guys came, but you're afraid of them. And now you're neglecting to do something you should be doing. Sometimes I think, we think, if we kind of fear man and kind of don't stand firm, won't God understand? You know, he's a loving God. Won't he understand? I don't think so. I think he understands, but I don't think he likes it. When so many people through the ages, and some even now in our present day, are being killed because they stand for Christ, and I don't think God understands or at least doesn't accept when you kind of back away from standing for Christ in your little small circle. No, I don't think he understands in the sense that he accepts it at all. And remember that standing strong for issues is not the same as standing strong for Christ. I believe that Chris, Christian issues, biblical issues, they need to be stand, stood for. I believe, uh, I'm glad that you do, that you stand uh, 
against abortion, that you stand against uh, liquor, and you stand against all these things. I think that's good, but that doesn't mean you're standing for Christ. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and he said, uh, if we do good deeds, and, and, and we in no way identify ourselves as a Christian, God doesn't get any glory from it. If they know we've done these good deeds because we're Christians, then God can be glorified. But they just may think you're just a good person. And you're not, but your God is. If you want to know whether you're bold for the Lord, take a couple of simple tests here. Do the people around you know you belong to Jesus Christ and that you desire to follow Him and serve Him? When I say people around you, I mean your family, I mean your uh, bigger, larger family, your relationships, I mean your neighbors, I mean your co-workers, I mean, do they really know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? If they do, you have probably stood in boldness. Do you find it fairly easy to make a stand for issues, but pretty difficult to identify with Jesus Christ? Please remember, our job is that we are Christians first and foremost. Not even issues supersede that. I'm a Christian first and foremost. So do those who know you know that first and foremost, you are a follower of Christ. And if they don't, I think it would be a good time for you to get on your knees before God and repent and commit yourself to God. Commit yourself to telling those people around you in the best way you can at the right timing that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. That's who you are more than anything else. That's who you are. Let's pray. Our Father God, Knowing this body, Lord, I know that almost all of them are strong followers of Jesus Christ, and they don't mind letting people know that. I thank you for that, Lord. It's a joy to be among such a beautiful group of people that stand strong, and their friends and their neighbors and their co-workers and everybody around them know that they're followers of Jesus Christ. But Lord, if they're beginning to back away from that commitment, or maybe there are some who really are not that strong, I pray, Father, you would give them the grace to be able to start, even today, to identify themselves as Christians, and in some way, not to necessarily let people in the church know, because we'd be in favor of it, but let those people in their workplace know, their neighbors know, that they their desire is to follow Jesus Christ in their life. And I pray for that grace. I pray for every man, woman, boy and girl, Lord. I know that young people have so much trouble with peer pressure, and it's so difficult in so many ways to make a stand for Jesus Christ. But Lord, every one of our young people would be so much better, better off, strengthened, if they would identify themselves as followers of Jesus to whatever crowd they happen to be with and that they're not ashamed of you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.